uh, you know, it was it was easy. Uh, I just show up at the office, kind of, you know, play my part and collect a paycheck and uh, and happiness would follow. But hollowness followed. I, I just I didn't feel like it was me. I didn't feel like there was any meaning to what I was doing. And I felt like I was just putting on an act. And I remember talking to some of my friends one time and and they said, you're, you know, they noticed this in me. And they said, you know, you're just, you're, you're really not happy here, are you? And I said, um, you know, I'm dealing. And they said, no, no, we're dealing, you're miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I think they saw it in me. And I, I, you know, one night on my 30th birthday, and I write about this in my first book, I kind of saw the, you know, the, the future. And I thought, I'm going to be 50 years old. I'm going to be fat and bald and, you know, driving a nice red sports car you know, and be really, really miserable. And is that where you want your life to go? Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have the amazing Dean Cananzas. Dean was named as one of the most influential people in the world by Time magazine. Dean has run 50 marathons in all 50 US states in 50 consecutive days. He's run across Death Valley in the middle of summer, won the world's toughest foot race, the Badwater Ultra Marathon, won the Four Deserts Challenge, and he has even run a marathon to the South Pole. Dean is also a New York Times bestselling author with his book, Ultra Marathon Man, and I've thoroughly enjoyed his more recent book, A Runner's High. What I personally love about this conversation is Dean's zest for life. Dean has been on a lot of podcasts in his time, So I wanted to take the opportunity to ask him some more deeper questions about his life of running. We speak about his wild beast within, this wild, raw and very real part of us. We speak about the development of his relationship with his father and how he continues to draw strength and inspiration from his sister who passed at a young age. We speak about the fear of becoming irrelevant of how over time aging can challenge your sense of identity and how the focus changes from achievement to contribution. That it is not what you get, but what you give that is important. And we end the conversation with a reflection on how to live life where Dean shares this powerful statement, the bold don't live forever, but the timid don't live at all. Please enjoy this powerful and insightful conversation with the inspiring Dean Cananzas. Welcome to the To Be Human podcast, Dean. <laughs> Thanks for having me run by. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dean, I want to start with a quote from your latest book, A Runner's High. Um, and this book is, is certainly um, in the space of ultra running. I know I've shared this book with a few of my friends and all of them are in the midst of reading it. So that's definitely credit to your writing and your experiences. So I want to share, um, yeah, a paragraph from your book. You said, honestly, I couldn't handle typical day-to-day living. I didn't have the makeup for it. Some people lived by routine, but for me doing something predictable predictable every day was like a slowly wilting flower. Death coming in imperceptible degrees, a petal gradually falling off, then another and another, until eventually all that remained was a shriveled and frail stem of a man. Routine was death of the worst kind, a slow, insidious stripping of soul. So I would love for you to share, Dean, more about your earlier life that was based on that routine and that began to reflect that stripping of your soul. Wow. Yeah. I mean, those, the way you read that was so powerful. (laughs) (laughs) You read it better than the the quote itself, but that was uh, amazing. Yeah. I I think you should read my next book. You should be like the uh, the narrator. (laughs) Yeah. So Dean, I would love for you to share, um, because I know, you know, obviously, 
going back sort of more to your corporate days when you started ultra marathon running, this dates back to probably around 25 years ago, which, you know, in your life seems like a long time ago. But I think for some of us that have followed your journey, when we read your books, it can seem so recent still. And I think there is so much power in that initial part of your journey and your story. So I would love for you to share more about that time in your life when it was about routine, when it was about going into the office and and not sort of getting out and feeling more of that freedom that you experience now. Because I think a lot of my listeners, a lot of them are adventurers, but a lot of them are also people that have the nine to five, that have to work five days a week and don't fully get to express who they are and, and that sense of fulfillment. So if you could share sort of your transformation between coming, becoming from someone that was that sort of nine to five corporate life into now someone that has spent so much of his life um, being identified as a runner and, and essentially making your livelihood from it too. Yeah, well, I, I think I did, you know, I followed the kind of the prescribed route for happiness um, in Western mm-hmm. culture. You know, that is uh, you go to a good university which I did. And then I went to a good graduate school, a good graduate program after university. And and then I went to business school and I had a very comfortable corporate job in San Francisco. You know, I had a a nice paycheck. I had, uh, you know, stock options, a company car, uh, you know, free healthcare, all that sort of thing. Uh, And it was comfortable. (laughs) Let's face it. uh, You know, it was, it was easy. I just show up at the office, kind of, you know, play my part and collect a paycheck and uh, and happiness would follow. But hollowness followed. I I just I didn't feel like it was me. I didn't feel like there was any meaning to what I was doing. And I felt like I was just putting on an act. And I remember talking to some of my friends one time and and they said, you're, you know, they noticed this in me. And they said, you know, you're just, you're, you're really not happy here, are you? And I said, um, you know, I'm dealing. And they said, no, no, we're dealing. You're miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I think they saw it in me. And I, I, you know, one night on my 30th birthday, and I write about this in my first book, I kind of saw the, you know, the, the future. And I thought, I'm going to be 50 years old. I'm going to be fat and bald and, you know, driving a nice red sports car you know, and be really, really miserable. And is that where you want your life to go? And I made a decision that night. No, it's not. And (laughs) damn it, I'm (laughs) I'm, going to run away from all that. And I literally uh, did just that. Yeah. So talk to me more about that night, because I think it's, it's so powerful, these defining moments in our life. And they can, they can be so extreme as well. Like you said, you know, you're one minute you're celebrating your 30th birthday as as a somewhat unfulfilled man, sort of seeing the trajectory of your future turn into this sense of unfulfillment and 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 also not not being healthy or, or fit or anything like that. Talk to me about that night and you know, what was going through your mind when you sort of committed to running 30 miles that night? <laughs> Bad alcohol was going through my mind. <laughs> so I was in a, I was in a bar in a pub, you know, with my mates doing what a lot of people do on their thirtieth birthday. You know, I was drinking, and at midnight I told them I was going to leave, and they said, "Why? I mean, you know, it's your thirtieth birthday. The night is young. Let's have another round of tequila." And I said, "No, I'm going to run thirty miles to celebrate my thirtieth birthday instead, which is you know about close to fifty kilometers, like forty nine kilometers." And they looked at me and they said, but you're, but you're not a runner, you're drunk. <laughs> and I said, I am, but I'm still going to do it. So it was kind of, uh, I think, uh, a culmination of, you know, something had been percolating inside me for years and, and alcohol. And, you know, I think, you know, as Thoreau said, a lot of, a lot of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I just thought I'm going to, I'm just going to be slowly miserable for the next three decades of my life you know, I'll I'll get a gold watch when I retire and (laughs) sail off in the sunset and and never really find who I am. And I think it just that night, I guess 30 years old is kind of young to have a midlife crisis. But I think that's what I had is a midlife crisis. And you have to remember as well, you know, the era that we're talking about, it, it was very uncommon to, you know, to bust off on your own and, you know, forge your own path. 
nowadays it's almost commonplace, right? I mean, there's gig workers, there's so many opportunities now to do your own thing, not to get into the corporate scene. But, you know, a couple of decades ago, that was kind of like, that was like the main option. There, were, there weren't people like, there weren't nearly as many entrepreneurs. There weren't people with right. podcasts, you know, there weren't people making a go of it, doing entrepreneurial things that they really enjoy. So it was a, it was a different era. And I know the journey of self-exploration is so important to you and this like really stands out in, in all of your writing. And I know that running for you has been this sort of exploration of like understanding who you are and what you want to do in this world. And I'd love to know, you know, was there a defining moment that you can think throughout your running experience where you really truly came to feel like, ah, oh, that's it. Like I'm getting really close to understanding who I am. It's, it's kind of come with age, you know, mm. I think that, you know, age in, in a lot of ways brings wisdom because you have so much life experience to reflect on. And, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, running gives us a lot of time to think. And that's one thing I, I really enjoy about running is you, you can, you can think about your life. You can think about situations. Um, you're free to think for yourself where most of the day we're kind of bombarded with incoming noise and running is a, a way to kind of escape that. But I think that, you know, it, it wasn't until later in my career that I, I kind of said, I think I, I was looking through a list of like the, the top 10 athletes or top 20 athletes in running kind of globally. And, and I was on this list and I was looking through the other people on the list. And I mean, <laughs> I think there was one other one other person that was in their 30s. Everyone else was in their 20s. Wow. And I don't want to tell you how old I am, but I'm a few decades <laughs> beyond that. And I'm like, how am I still on that list? It <laughs> it finally occurred to me, like, my God, you've been doing this. You've been kind of like competing at a high level for for nearly three decades, and that's amazing. I mean, even you know, you hear about you know the famous tennis players, for instance, like you know uh, Serena Williams or Roger Federer. And, you know, they're in their 30s and people are saying, my God, I can't believe they're still you know, playing and they're in their 30s. And I'm thinking, I'm in my 50s and I'm still doing these things. Yeah, it's so absolutely incredible. And I'll definitely, I, I would love to speak to you more about impact a little later. But in terms of self-exploration, something, a, a theme that you talk about and it was really similar to a man I had recently on the podcast, a man called Paul uh, Watkins. He was a winner of an ultra called 6633 Arctic Ultra. And he sort of talked about the savage within. And I know within your stories, you talk, sort of talk about we all have this wild beast inside of us. And I'd love to learn more about that from you, Dean, because I know that when you speak about running, you speak about almost this like purging of modernity. Anytime that you get out in nature and you run, you sort of feel closer to, to who you are away from sort of this more modernized society. And so I'd love for you to share more about this concept of all of us having this wild beast within. Yeah, you're, you're perceptive to pick up on that. Um, I, I mean, I think that I'm most connected when I'm alone in nature. I feel mm -hmm. most complete and most, I guess, most like a human should feel. <laughs> yeah. You know, we can't, we can't, that's what, where we came from. I mean, we've, we've modernized our existence very quickly, you know, in a couple hundred years, couple thousand years. But, you know, if you think about the, the vast majority of our evolution was out in the wild. And that has been kind of, I wouldn't say stripped away because it still exists, but most people live lives that are completely devoid of, of nature. I mean, most people don't have a relationship with nature where for me to go running off in, on a trail for four or five hours by myself and not see another human is, it's almost, I'm more comfortable doing mm -hmm. that than I am like even talking to you on a podcast. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm like, I, I don't, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. It feels like, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like contrived, mm -hmm. but when you get out there uh, in nature, and especially when you're doing these really protracted events, like running in Antarctica, uh, you know, running across uh, a desert. I, I mean, I love doing these extreme runs in extreme environments. You feel the savagery. I mean, you just feel this uh, primordial uh, human that comes out. It kind of manifests, and yeah, it's it's wild. It's um, it, it's raw and it's real. 
And what do you think is just from your own experience, and I know that so many people have shared their stories with you, people that come across your story are so heavily inspired and people are really excited to share how you've impacted their life. Throughout those stories, what do you think is that resistance to getting out in nature and sort of more embracing that more inherent sort of savage within? You know, I think that there's fear. Uh, I think that it's it's foreign to people. They don't know how to approach it. Uh, you know, the, it's 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 culturally it hasn't been. I think it's changing. I think with especially with the pandemic, more people are discovering the outdoors. But I think culturally, we got away from the outdoors, and we also got into very. Uh, even when you talk about the outdoors, so much of the outdoor experience, especially in the U.S., is, is very curated. You know, you go to Yosemite or you go to Yellowstone and, you know, you drive to a certain place, you park with everyone, all the tourists, you know, you walk on uh, a footpath that's roped off. Uh, That to me is really not nature. So I think people that have done that have said, well, I want a more immersive experience. Maybe I'll try, you know, backpacking or just even hiking for a day on a trail. But it's how do you even approach it? And, you know, the other thing is that your circle of friends, I mean, your friends influence you so much. If you're not surrounded by outdoor people, you know, if that's not your group, uh, then, you know, it, it, it's not kind of even on the top of your, your radar. It's not something you would think to do. You know, if you have a, a spare Saturday, you know, you'd maybe go to a concert or something, which is fine. But like my, my friends are saying, <laughs> let's go running in the Sierra and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's so beautiful. And it's, this reminds me of a concept that you spoke about, sort of action versus inaction and the way in which it shapes who we are. And I really loved this concept because I feel like in this day and age, it all it is always about like that productivity and, and getting things done. And we focus so much on what we're doing that I, I, I really loved the idea of actually reflecting on the things that we aren't doing and how that's impacting our lives and who we are. Can you share a little bit more about that concept? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, I'm 100% Greek. So I, I've read a lot of uh, ancient Greek. And um, Socrates said, uh, beware of the emptiness of a busy life. Mm. <laughs> and I think people, <laughs> I think there's a lot to be said about that. And he said that 2,500 years ago, but I think it's even more relevant today. Uh, so, you know, to me, running gives us time to think. And I always enjoy conversations with runners because they're typically pretty, pretty insightful. Because, you know, when you go running, you have a lot of time on your hands and, you know, you tend to think, at least I tend to think about deeper sort of things, deeper questions. And, it, you know, it piques my curiosity to, to seek answers to these things, which leads me to reading more widely. But, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of famous writers, I could go through the list, Nietzsche, uh, I talked about Thoreau, they, they were wanderers. Even uh, Aristotle was called a peripatetic. Uh, he used to just wander around Athens, you know, mm-hmm. for six, seven, eight hours, just walking around. And I could know what he's doing. I mean, he's thinking a lot and he's seeing things and he's thinking through situations. So to me, um, to to really explore your mind, you need to free your mind. And that means not, mm-hmm. you know, being in a screen or being occupied by uh, incoming stimulus all the time. Yeah, I love that. And it also reminds me, you mentioned sort of the, this concept of, Something along the lines of like, you know, be aware if you're just sort of like moving busily or if you're moving forward, something along those lines. And I just love that so much because I think it's so relevant to the now of people just being so, so busy. But it's like the question of, are you progressing? Are you growing? Are you moving forward? It's such a different, different part of, of what we're doing to focus on. And I think it's really powerful. So Dean, What I would love to um, speak to you about is, you know, I would love to know more about sort of your spirituality when it comes to running, because in my experience of running, it's a, it's a deeply spiritual practice. And um, it's sort of on, on many layers in terms of sort of my own internal growth, but also my own relationship and discovery of, of something greater than myself. And I know that you have, you know, had, some come to Jesus moments as you and your friends describe. <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to, for you to share a, a come to Jesus moment and, and what that meant to you. You know, I think when you talk about spirituality, at least for me, when I, when I think about what's actually going on, I think it's, it's essentially a stripping away of ego. 
So Mm -hmm. you lose yourself. And, you know, typically we analyze situations based on uh, is this good for me or bad for me? It's it's self preservation. It's just how right. we've you know evolved to think. When you when something happens or you move through the world, you're constantly evaluating: is this going to threaten me or is this going to be good for me? And what happens when you your ego gets whittled away is you don't think those things. You, you just be, and you just you're just part of of the something greater, as you said. So you lose yourself to something bigger than yourself, mm-hmm. and. You know, when I run an ultra marathon, especially difficult ones, that happens, and it's it's really beautiful. It's it's like a transcendent moment where you're freed from your ego. You're you're essentially unbounded, and mm. to me, that's really liberating. And it's 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 not easy to achieve this. And I think, you know, I think I said in the book that you know, in running an ultra marathon, we we achieve in 24 hours what takes a monk a month of meditation. <laughs> so I know people that meditate and know how to meditate and spend a lot of time meditating, get to the same spot. But for me, I need to be in motion to get to that spot. And what do you think has been one of your greatest lessons having these really deep experiences? Because as you're saying, you know, we learn what a monk would learn in a month of meditation. We do have these profound life-changing lessons that happen to us in a very short period of time. What has been one of the most defining ones for you you know, just, just realizing that you're part of something greater, you know, you, you're, mm-hmm. you know, you, as much as we think we're everything and the universe <laughs> revolves around us, it's right. really not the case. I mean, you're, you know, we're all part of something that's, that's much grander than us. And, you know, when, when you can accept that and be comfortable with that, um, again, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's a freedom that is like nothing else. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I think, I mean, I, I don't experiment uh, with drugs anymore. I, I did a little bit, but I think when, you know, like when I've taken hallucinogenics, the couple of times I've done that when, you know, I was younger, it was kind of that same feeling where you're just, you're so absorbed in what you're absorbed in, you forget about you. It's so incredibly powerful. And it kind of reminds me of flow state. And I know that this is really an important practice uh, for you in terms of performance. Can you share more about sort of your journey into understanding the importance of being in the present in, you know, I guess not only your performance, but also in your life? Yeah, it, I think it, it it stemmed from really paying attention to how do I respond when things get tough, when things get really difficult? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's going on in my head? And how do I get how do I get through it? Because people always say, you know, when you when you hit the wall or when you have a really deep low, you know, how do you push on? Is there a mantra? You know, what sort of mind game do you play? And I tried those things and they don't work because, <laughs> you know, you, you can't fool yourself. <laughs> We're pretty smart. I mean, at, at a moment you come to the realization, I'm just chanting this mantra because it hurts so badly. I'm trying to divert my attention and it's not working. So what I what I tend to do is is just absorb in the moment. So just be in the present, the here and now. Uh, Don't think about the future. Don't reflect on the past. Uh, Just be in the present moment of time. And that's not easy to do. Uh, Our minds are very active. Our minds wander and our minds are constantly skittering around. To bring your attention and your mind back to the present moment of time, it, it takes disciplined thought and it takes some practice. So I just say to myself, you know, take your next step to the best of your ability. Mm-hmm. Take your next step to the best of your ability. And that's, it literally get that granular. All I'm focused on is taking my next step. I don't think about the future. I don't think about how far I've got to go. I don't reflect on the past. Uh, I'm just here and now and, and being the best I can be in that moment. And it is a, a flow, like, it's almost like a Zen-like state. It is very much in, in flow. And when you're in that zone, you can get through anything. I'm convinced of that. Yeah, I remember when I first started sort of more doing the long distance running, um, I had a few people share that form of advice, you know, just one step in front of the other. And I thought, gosh, this is such basic advice. Like I really didn't take it to be as important as like other more complex advice. But very quickly I came to realize 
how absolutely important that advice is. And if anything, it's probably the important because it is when you're in that sort of hurt locker of pain, just taking one step in front of the other is the most important thing. And, you know, I loved in your book, you sort of share almost the concept of like, just make it so simple. It's like, you know, be on the start line and then like finish at the end. And it's like two things that you need to tick off. Okay, I'm on the start line <laughs> and now I just need to get to the end. And I, I love it because I'm starting to get that in sort of the more endurance um, experiences, it is more of these like simple ideas that are sort of the greatest teachers. Yeah. And it, it certainly prepares you for anything. You know, I know a lot of people, um, you know, e even running a marathon, the thought of, of doing one thing for, you know, three or four or five hours is so foreign because mm -hmm. how often do we just focus on one thing for that amount of time? And, you know, when you're running a hundred mile foot race, you know, you're, you're really, you're kind of uh, in the moment. I mean, you're, the task at hand is so demanding, it commands your attention. So you're just focused about getting to the finish line. You, you got two things to do, right? I get to the starting line and get to the finish line. And there's this kind of solidarity of purpose that's, that's really cleansing. And I've talked to mountain climbers that have said the same thing. They said, you know, in preparing for the expedition, um, you know, life is frenetic. There's a lot of moving pieces. You're thinking about this and that. But when you're on the mountain, the rules of engagement become crystal clear. I mean, there's there's a summit and to succeed, you get to the summit. If you don't reach the summit, you don't succeed. It's black mm -hmm. and white and all efforts are kind of focused on that one goal. And you can get through storms, you can get through whatever, because you know, <laughs> you know where you're going. You have this sense of purpose. Right. And what do you think, Dean, out of all the running that you have done, which is certainly a lot, what do you think has been the one run that you've gone on that sort of you've had the most profound lesson with? I, uh, I one time ran a 10K uh, with my daughter, Alexandria, on her Beautiful. 10th birthday. And I think that was that was so revealing because she she wanted to run this 10k like i, I never pushed running on my kids because i was kind of afraid of the you know the parental backlash right so she said i want to run the 10k dad with you on my 10th birthday and of course i was you know over the moon with this and we were running the 10k which is uh you know it's it's quite it's it's 6.2 miles for for you yanks <laughs> and it, that's quite a distance for a 10 year old she got to about I would say what kilometer close to kilometer eight. So about five miles in and she was falling apart. I could just tell it really hurt her. And she was kind of staggering and mumbling a bit. And I was going to turn to her and say, you know, Alexandria, I'm so proud of you for having the courage to try and we'll come back. We'll do another 10 K. I mean, you're what you've done is amazing. And right when I was going to say that to her, she turned to me and she said, dad, I can do this. And she kind of <laughs> grunted. She kind of went, Arr! and she started sprinting. I'm like, oh my wow. God, this is wonderful. <laughs> and and she sprinted. I, I couldn't keep up with her the rest of the way. So she made it to the finish line and it was, you know, it was amazing. And it just, it showed me something about a person I'd never seen before. And I, I'm her dad. You know, you think you know everything about a person. All of a sudden they reveal this other side of them, this inner mm -hmm. strength. And it just really hit me that, um, that was, that was, I mean, I'll never, I'll never forget that moment. That was, it was really special. Yeah. It sounds so incredibly special. And that's certainly, you know, a, a theme that I received in your, your latest book of runners high was, you know, your reflections on family and, you know, in your book, you say family matters. Family is the most important thing. And I would love to talk about your father because he's certainly a character <laughs> that has shown up in your stories and obviously in your life. And as someone that hasn't met him, I just get the gist that he's just such an amazing, incredible person. And I certainly had a, a lot of laughs during reading your stories, particularly because I just love the aspect of him still calling you ultra marathon man <laughs> and you still getting embarrassed. And I just, I love that. I just love that he continues to do that. I think there's something so beautiful about a parent still being able to embarrass your, your child, even when they have children themselves. <laughs> so it's, um yeah, it was very warming to, to read about him. And I'd love to know more about your relationship with your father because you know, you refer to him as your, you know, loyal companion. And by the sounds of it, he's just there 
for you whenever you need um, so wittingly and just wants to be there. And it's just such a beautiful part of your story as someone that's following it. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to know more about your relationship with your father and how that has influenced, you know, your your greater success. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll um, tell you a story about high school and it'll illustrate um, my relationship with my dad. You know, he used to come to every single event I was in, no matter what. He would just, you know, any running event, any, I used to play volleyball, any volleyball event, anything I was, anytime I was doing something involved with athletics and sports, uh, he was there. And I didn't always want him there. Like what kid <laughs> wants her dad at all these events? <laughs> But some of my friends, some of my mates, their dads never came to any of their events. Mm -hmm. And now in hindsight, I realized just how lucky I was that I had this, this, I, he was a rock. He was there. I just knew he'd be there. Even though I didn't want him there, he would be there. And, you know, reflecting back on that, it just gave me the foundation um, to feel comfortable in my own skin. And, and knowing I had a companion that faithfully is going to be there by my side, whether we won, whether we lost, whether I played well or ran well or whether I didn't, he's going to be there. Yes, yeah, so it's so beautiful. And I love um, the example you gave of um, the Western, uh, was it the Western States or the Bishop, where you and your father just had such an intimate moment, you know, reflecting on the loss of your sister. Because I know from the, the first book, Ultra Marathon Man, you shared that unfortunately you lost your sister on the eve of her 18th birthday. And and from what I've followed about you, Dean, you know, it, it truly has been an experience in itself of you trying to find some form of inner peace with such a challenging experience. And, and particularly for your father and your mother and your family, you know, it's been, it's been rough. It's been challenging. And I know that running's really helped you and your father with that. Could you share more of your, I guess, like more up-to-date insight on 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 your father and your reflection on that experience and where you're at now, do you have sort of some sense of inner peace with it all? You know, I, for those of you that uh, don't know my story, I mean, I, um, I lost my sister uh, on her 18th birthday and I was a couple of years older than her and we were really best friends. I mean, she was like my best pal, my confidant. And it was, it was rough. Uh, it was really rough on everyone. I mean, when these things happen, at least in my family, it just, it crushes you. It, it just breaks the fabric of this family unit because we are a very close family and, and it doesn't get discussed. It, it kind of is, it's too, it's too painful to even bring up, but you know, it's there. So every subsequent holiday, every birthday, you want to talk about it, but you don't want to talk about it, but you know, mm -hmm. it's on every family member's mind. So it's awkward. And, you know, it took me a long time to, to reconcile uh, my emotions and to come full circle and to say, you know, you, the best thing you can do is live your life to its fullest, to honor your sister. That's what she would want. And, you know, I came to that place and, and it took me a decade. It took me all of the, you know, the stages of bereavement, if you will. And there was, there was denial, there was anger, <laughs> there was self-destruction, a lot of self-destruction. A lot, of, a lot of alcohol, unfortunately, but um, it never solved the problem until I started running and really thought through, you know, how, how best to conduct myself moving forward. But for any, you know, any, any child that has lost a sibling and seen what it does to your parents, you know that essentially, I think I write this in the book, you know, the, the worst thing that can happen to a parent happens. There, there can be nothing worse for a parent than to lose a child, especially a loved child. And when that happens, you, you know, you, you see how people respond. And, you know, my parents, it brought them closer. Eventually, they, they're, you know, they've been married for 60 years. <laughs> and well. it, 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 it brought them together. And, it, and unfortunately, these kind of situations drive a lot of relationships uh, apart. But they came together. It, 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 it's been... Many, many years uh, since Perry's uh, passing, but it's still something I think about every single day, and I'm sure my parents do as well. And I know that you speak about, you know, wanting to honor your sister, and I think that is 
you know, in such a, a tragic experience, it's one of the most beautiful gifts that can be given to someone is to truly, and you speak about this actually in your book, to to have that opportunity of being able to truly honor someone's life by living your life through that honoring. Do you still in your decision-making reflect on what you do in the sense of, you know, questioning would this honor Perry and me doing this? I do. And I draw, I draw on her all the time because, you know, living my life is, is it's not, it's not always easy. And I, I mean, I don't want to complain because I have the greatest life ever, but it takes some effort on my behalf and it takes some hustle mm -hmm. and it takes some groveling. I mean, you know, I don't have a paycheck. I don't have a consistent job. I've got to go and, and make a go of it every single day. I mean, I have bills to pay. I have just like everyone else. And that sometimes is, is, you know, you get rejected. You hear no a lot. And it, sometimes it's, it's hard to bounce back from that. And I've certainly, um, found the resolve to, you know, to, to keep trying because of my reflections about Perry and, you know, me thinking you've got to be true to the man you are. And the man you are is, is this outdoor athlete, is this runner that, you know, is kind of living the life I'm living. And yeah, it is glamorous and it's wonderful, but it is also at times tough. And during those tough times, I really, uh, I really, you know, draw strength from Perry. And saying, you know, yeah, you can go get a corporate job, but that's, you know, you're you're copping out. You know, you you've you've dedicated your life to being who you are and to following what's inside your heart. Stay true to that. I think it's such a powerful lesson, and I think we all go through a similar reflection, particularly you know those of us that work for ourselves. It does. It seems like that cop out of going back into a stable job with a stable income is always just sort of something that's right there that you can always turn to. And I know in my own life, it certainly, you know, it seems alluring at times, but then, you know, you know, I do remind myself, you know, how unfulfilled I was in that situation. And is it truly, you know, honoring a life well lived? And, and I don't, I don't think it is. And I think, you know, you speak about the concept of like, do do I want to live a long life or a full life? And I, I just love how you're like, I want to live a full life. I want to live a passionate life. And there's something so beautiful in that. And I would love for you to speak more about passion because I know that it's something that is so important to you. And you're certainly the epitome of someone that has lived a passionate life. And I'd love for you to share for those that maybe feel like they have a passion, but they haven't, you know, taken action or sort of leaned more into it your thoughts around sort of being able to move more into that space? Yeah, I mean, my guidance to people is, I just say, is script your perfect life. And mm -hmm. so write a script. <laughs> just And this is free form. I mean, you can type it if you want. You can write it on a notepad. But just imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and you were doing exactly what you wanted to be doing. What would your life look like? Literally, get as granular as what clothes you would be wearing, you know, where would you have an office? Where would that office be? Where would you live? Who would be your friends? Would you be married or not married? Would you have a family or not? Uh, really get that specific about what your perfect life would look like. And a lot of people, when I tell them this, like, oh, I know what, you know, I'm, I'll be a multi billionaire and I'll be retired <laughs> and living in Tahiti. Right. <laughs> and then and they get back to me and they say, you know, when I sat there and started writing these things, I felt like a jackass. Like that's mm -hmm. really not, that wouldn't bring me fulfillment. That like, isn't like, I want to be a Peace Corps worker. And that is really going to be something that I feel good about. And so I just say, script out your perfect life. And at least then you have a roadmap of where you want to go. Because if you don't know where you want to go, you'll never get there. <laughs> right. You just wander around kind of lost. So I, I, I say, use that, um, use and, and come back to that script and you can revise it but stay true to it. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful lesson. And I'd love to know, Dean, how has your perfect life changed from when you first started running? Yeah, I mean, when I first started, I, I just wanted to conquer every insane event <laughs> I heard about, mm -hmm. you know, 135 miles across Death Valley in the middle of summer. Yeah, let's do it. You know, <laughs> um, Running a marathon to South Pole, bring it. <laughs> You know, I still have desires to do a lot of uh, crazy adventures like that, but more so now I kind of see my role as, um, I guess, uh, motivating and empowering others to, to seek, seek their dreams, to search mm -hmm. out and, and, and 
seek out their dreams and follow their passions. I think that uh, a lot of people read my first book and they changed their lives. And I think that that book just kind of gave people permission, like, hold it, this guy did this. Like, I want to do this. This guy actually did it. It can be done. I'm, damn it, I'm going to try. So if I can do that, then I'm pretty happy. You certainly are doing that. And, you know, there was certainly some deeper reflection of yours in your latest book. And one that really stuck out to me was sort of this theme of having a fear of becoming irrelevant. And, you know, it's not the most comfortable of subjects, but I really honored and respected you for including it in this book because, you know, this is sort of part of why I do this podcast is about humanizing high performers. And, you know, from the outside, we can look at Dean and think that you have the most perfect life and everything, you know, we don't know that you grovel every day to sort of be able to work for yourself and keep a roof over your family's head. Like these are things that we don't always think about. We always just see the highlight reel. And it was in this book that it was just, yeah, I just had such an honor for you sharing some of these more vulnerable topics that a lot of people don't share. And, you know, the topic of aging, particularly in sport, is an important topic. And I had someone on the podcast recently, and I won't name who because we weren't recording when we were speaking about this, but they too were speaking about this kind of transition from becoming sort of this high achiever in sport to now sort of coming of age and maybe slowing down, things aren't working the way that they do. And your sense of identity is certainly challenged in all of that. And it's a journey um, in itself. So I would love for you to share, Dean, sort of more about those more recent reflections, those deeper reflections of of changing sort of more from, as you're saying, this person that's like, let's do this and let's do that. And it was just all about just diving into whatever to sort of coming more into that more reflecting and wiser part of your life? You know, I think um, in the end, it's, you know, it's, it's not what you get in life. It's what you give. Mm. Uh, and I'm just trying my best to, to give as much as I can to others. Any, any, anything I can do to help someone live a more complete life. That is what I want to, what I want to do. And okay. I'm in a position to kind of do that, to have some influence. And I think it would be a sin not to. So, you know, to me, the, my highest calling is, you know, when I get messages from people that say, you know, the first line, the first sentence is you changed my life. Mm. Every time I read that, I like, I get the tingles like, wow, wow. Like, I don't know how I changed your life. I don't, I don't <laughs> think I'm worthy of changing your life, but if it worked, then there's something there that I need to continue. And what do you think one of the most beautiful moments has been for you, Dean, in relation to changing someone's life? When have you felt like you've contributed the most? <laughs> you know, I get it all, the, I get it. I, I, it's, it's the most unexpected places. You know, like um, a couple nights ago, I was having dinner with my family um, at a restaurant in San Francisco and we were sitting outside and uh, we ended up sitting on a footpath. I didn't even know the foot, this was a footpath. It was kind of behind like the Embarcadero but it was a footpath and this group of runners came running through this area. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. There's, there's like a bunch of runners out at night, first of all. And this guy looked at me as he's running by and he's like, oh my God, oh my, you're Dean Carnassus. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at it like, yeah, I have dinner and like, I, yeah, I eat too, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and all his friends gathered around there and they're like, oh God, this guy loves you. He talks about you. Wow. We're so sick of hearing the stories about it. Now we got to meet you. And I'm sitting there having dinner with my family. And now everyone in the restaurant is looking at me like I'm famous, which I'm not. So and that, I mean, that happened a couple nights ago. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful to be able to have that reaction from people, particularly like in the area of, of changing people's lives like you're literally you know dedicating your life as a representation of you know good health and and activity and I, th I think that's so beautiful and you know for some of the listeners that you know I have a lot of running listeners a lot of endurance orientated listeners that I know are absolutely going to, to love this and be fueled by this but I'd love to ask in relation to maybe a listener that you know what knows that there's something more is, is maybe more of the dean that was 30 years old, that kind of knew that that was something more than what the life they're currently living. What is something that you would say to maybe encourage them to sort of, you know, quote unquote, take that next step um, in their life? 
you know, I, I, I guess there's a saying I have that, you know, the, the bold don't live forever, but the timid don't live at all. Mm, so beautiful. I don't know. I think in the end, even when I failed, uh, I'm glad I tried. I think mm. what I regret most in life are things I, I never tried. <laughs> Wow. You know, the kind of uh, if onlys, right. I call them. And you try to have few if onlys in your life when you're looking back saying, oh, if only I had, if only, if only, if only. And when I look back, there's not a lot of if onlys. Well, I would have bought Apple stock at $6. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> there's not a lot of if onlys. <laughs> yeah. And then probably in another 20 years, we'll probably say, I wish I bought it now. <laughs> yeah. But um. Yeah, I, I definitely resonate with that, Dean. And it's something that I certainly apply in my own life is at any moment that something comes along where I have some form of hesitation that might be because of fear of, you know, going into the unknown, I truly ask, you know, in, in 20 years, 30 years, if I look back, I think it's called, you know, the rocking chair test to to think, would I would I regret this? And I think it's such a powerful way to decision make because you realize that if it's just a little fear that's keeping you from really changing, you know, the trajectory of your life to living a more fulfilled and passionate life, then, you know, by all means, like lean in and do it. And people like you are a prime example of what that looks like. And time and time again on this podcast, people that I speak to that have done that are the fulfilled type. They're not just the high achievers. They have that fulfillment tied into it. And there's something so beautiful and empowering about that. So Thank you, Dean, for this conversation. I, I truly appreciate being able to connect with you. It's just been such an honor. I've got all your books and I've been reading them and it's just been such an amazing journey. And I know personally, you've changed my life too. So I hope that you truly feel that day in, day out, even if you don't hear it every day, that you are truly changing people's lives. Well, I, I, I certainly am very grateful that you said that. So I appreciate it. And, you know, I look forward to the day we can share some footsteps together. Be beautiful. So, Dean, on a final note, I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you to be human? What does it mean to be human? That is, that's a pretty deep question. It's a question. loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it can be just today. What does it mean to you today to be human? You know, to me, it, to be human to me is to be uh, completely absorbed in something grand. Uh, we, we sometimes, I think, lose, I mean, I'm going to qualify that. We sometimes, I think, lose sight of, uh, of how beautiful the world is. We get so uh, caught up in the transactional, uh, mm. you know, making a living or doing this or that. And we never step back and just take a deep breath and say, wow. Life is pretty fucking cool. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what it means to be human. <laughs>